not connecting. Good evening, folks, and welcome as we join together this evening for our Bible study. And then afterwards, as we continue on to Zoom for our time of prayer, I'm just trying to get these cameras lined up so that you can actually see me. I'm not in shadow, so hopefully you can see me now. Um, but it's great. Thanks for joining with us. Whether you be on Facebook, whether it's on Zoom, uh, it's great to have you all here. Um, the internet connection is sort of playing up a little bit tonight. There must be too many people in the house trying to stream. Um, so hopefully it keeps going and it doesn't cut in and out. Um, and there's just somebody else coming in on Zoom and I'm going to say mute yourself as you come on the Zoom just so that it doesn't come into Facebook on you. So welcome folks as we come together. So let's pause and just as we start this evening, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you again for another glorious day, a, a day of your blessing, a day whenever we could gather to just enjoy you, no matter what we were doing, whether we were working, resting, uh, homeschooling, Lord, you, you've been with us every step of this day so far, and we thank you for that. Lord, we ask that you would continue to be with us this evening, just as we come to your word now, to look at it, to study it together, to see what it says. Uh, just help us and guide us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So folks, thanks for joining in. I'm going to read something. First of all, I'm going to read... Oh, my Bible has turned itself off using digital. So let me just read this first of all. We're in Hebrews 13 tonight. We're getting right to the very end of Hebrews. We may finish it tonight. We may not. We're just going to take our time and see how we get on with it. Um, so thank you as we join together. And just listen now. I'm going to read to you. We're picking up Hebrews chapter 13 at verse 4. So it says there, Give honour to marriage. Remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. So I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the example of their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. So do not be attracted to strange new ideas. Your strength comes from God's grace, not from rules about food which don't help those who follow them. We have an altar from which the priests in the tabernacle have no right to eat. Under the old system, the high priest bought the blood of the animals into the holy place as a sacrifice for sin and the bodies of the animals were burned outside the camp. So also Jesus suffered and died outside the city gates to make his people holy by means of his own blood. So let us go out to him outside the camp and bear the disgrace he bore. For this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. Therefore let us offer through Jesus our continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. Amen. We'll stop there at verse 16. Um, as we start to get into this chapter now, um, it does start to jump around a wee bit. The author sort of nearly seems disjointed at times. He's going from topic to topic. But what he's actually trying to do is give practical examples now um, of how to live for God. And he's trying to relate it to what's going on around him in the world at that time. He started off this chapter about keep on loving one another, which we looked at last week. Remember those who are in prison, um, you know, as it said about some of the entertained angels without realising it. It was about practical love. So he, he, he starts off with that sort of practical end of the game and he starts off within the household. So he starts off obviously talking to those who are married uh, by saying give honour to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. There was a culture at that time um, and you've got to remember that in those days women had no rights so it really was what the man said went so whenever a man got bored with a woman he simply divorced her and moved on to somebody else there was no commitment there was no commitment within their relationship now in Old Testament days, and it still happens in certain cultures today and in certain religious um, sects as well, where men are married to more than one woman. 
But you see a change happening in the New Testament where whenever Paul is talking and teaching about elders and deacons or leaders within the church, he's saying to men, you, you really should be married to just one wife and you should be showing commitment and honour. And, you know, again, it's that theme running through here, but how we should be committed to one another. If we're in that relationship, then we, we should be fully committed to that relationship. Because at the end of the day, if we can't commit to that relationship, which is tangible and in front of us, how do we commit to a relationship with God? How do we commit with somebody who we, we don't see, who we trust in faith, if we can't commit to the person who maybe literally is sitting right next to us right now? You know, that, that's the sort of thing he's trying to say. You have to be committed. So this, this is really a, a put down as such or a, a chastisement to men of the time. Um, you know, keep, keep the honour of your marriage. Just don't get bored with your wife and walk off. You know, like we all say, marriage has to be worked upon. It says God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Again, people use all sorts of reasons for what they do, but the Bible quite well. Clearly, clearly tells us stay committed stay faithful to one another and honour your voice now there's different teachings within the bible and not everybody is married and in fact Paul talks to men about um, it's better not to marry um, but if you can't control yourself then get married and things like that and all and that again is taken and twisted no, but it's all about that relationship so the author here is trying to give us a practical example of a relationship on earth and then how that relies or relates into our relationship with God. It's about that commitment and honour, getting things in the right place. So when you start to think of it that way, then what comes after that actually starts to fall into place and it doesn't seem as random. So verse five, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. Or I will never fail you. I will never forsake you. Um, most Bibles, if you were, if you have a footnote in your Bible, or if you've got, um, if you're on a digital one where you can click onto it, will reference that that quote is taken from Deuteronomy chapter thirty-one, verses six and eight. It's a, a com combination of the two. One little note to tell you as well is that it's also a quote taken from Joshua chapter one, verse five. Again, where Joshua is in doubt over his calling. And God tells him, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. I'm always going to be with you. And, and you know, the author is trying to get us in, you know, God is faithful to us. So we need to be faithful to him. And that comes off the back of that, don't love money or be satisfied with what you have. Um, when you look at the language that it's written in, um, the, it's a big long phrase, which a lot of Bibles translate it as um, the love of money. Um, another way of actually translating it is um, about being covetous or wanting something that you don't have. So whenever you start to look at it that way and you start to look at the language which is actually used, it doesn't just apply to money, but it applies to anything which we start to love or covet or want more than God. And the author says, don't love money or don't covet be satisfied with what you have. And that, the whole sense of that is that the satisfaction is not passive. Oh, like, this is all I've got, so this is all I'll deal with. But the, this, the, 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 the whole feeling behind it is that this is active, that we should actively be happy with what we have, that we shouldn't just be dismissive of what we have and, oh, well, hopefully I'll get a bit more. But wherever we find ourselves in life, we should relish we should be happy or we should see it as opportunities um, and be content in what we have because it is again going behind before and coming afterwards all about the relationship with God so that's why in verse 6 it says so we can say with confidence the Lord is my helper so I will have no fear what can mere people do to me and that's taken from Psalm 118 verse 6 you know, it's that whole sense that, which comes later on about, you know, I'm living here now. I've got what I've got. I'm here to serve God. Let's do it to the best of my ability, as best as I can. 
Let's make my relationships sound and secure so that my relationship with God is sound and secure. That in itself is challenging. You know, we're, we're quite often we're not content with what we have. Sure we're not. We want more. And it's easy to covet. It's easy to look at what other people have and think, hmm, I love that myself. You know, it's easy to get caught up in that. But all these things are temporary. None of them are lasting. But what is lasting is our relationship with God. And what we are building is a relationship now and a relationship for the future with God. So it is hard in one sense because we shouldn't wish away our life here on earth. We shouldn't want it finished to be in heaven because God has given us a place and a role here on earth. But it's realising that this rule, yes, is temporary for what comes in the future. So it's trying to get that right balance. And at all times, remember who we're serving, that we're serving God. It's interesting that that then is followed by verse 7. Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the example of their faith. So we're actively encouraged to look to our leaders uh, because our leaders hopefully in most things have got it worked out or in most things are, are at least trying to work it out in the best possible way so that we can learn from them. And you've got to remember as well, we learn not just from successes, but we learn from fails. So even when our leaders fail, we can still learn from that. We can see how they have failed and that can teach us not to go down that same road or not to fail in the same way. So everything, well, like say every day is a school day, is not the phrase that they use. Um, I know maybe I, that's pretty hard at the minute considering we're all homeschooling <laughs> and it's not that easy to do. Um, but for all of us, it's, it's about that continual learning in every aspect of our lives and how we you know, do that. But there's a flip side to that as well. So you may not think of yourself as a leader, but I am sure that for every one of us, there are people who look up to us, people who watch what we do, and people who are learning by what we do. Um, for those who are leaders, like for, for me, in the phrase, the teaching elder in the church, it's a scary phrase that people are actually looking to me for teaching and looking to me for leadership. And I think, <laughs> I'm, I'm only learning this as well. And, I, and I'm never going to stop learning this. But that's true for all of us. So for all of us, that verse rings out true. People are watching what we do. And again, that's scary. If, if we're honest, that is scary. Because people judge us on that. People point fingers at us on that. You know, if, if you're if you're re really into um, everything that's current in TV and all that, maybe you're going to be tuning in to the Harry and Meghan interview, um, which is coming up soon. Uh, and, and, and how things at the minute in the media, things are being pointed at Meghan. Um, and then maybe you, you might hear another side of it whenever it comes to that. You know, it, it doesn't matter what walk of life we're in. People watch us. It's not just those public figures. It's all of us. Um, you know, so it, it, it sort of cautions us about what we do and how we do it and the reasons why we do it. And just to remind us that, you know, we need to follow good examples then so that we can set good examples. Maybe that's again why verse 8 goes on then. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Because in all of that and in following all those examples, Jesus is our pure example. He is the, the, the gold standard and he doesn't change. I wonder if you can identify something in the Bible or something in your life which over the course of the last few years or maybe five or ten years that you have changed your opinion on it. Something that um, you thought you or you did believe one thing or you understood it in one way but now you understand it in a different way. Maybe it, you know take a silly example um, whenever you put petrol into your car and you open the flap on your on your car because all our cars now have flaps on it have you ever noticed a hook on the back of the flap door? If you're on Zoom, you can nod or shake your head. I can't see it on Facebook. 
next time you take your, your, your fuel cap off, look and see if there's a little notch in the back of your fuel cap for hooking that on. So maybe you had a thought that that hook was there, or that bit of metal was there just as a fluke, because it's just a bit of shape of metal. But then if someone teaches you there's something else, ah, you realise and it changes how you behave towards it. Well, think of that in terms of the Bible and in terms of our understanding and in terms of where we are. You know, at times people will maybe teach us and maybe we think it's something different and maybe we change our understanding. Jesus never changes. God's word never changes. It's always going to be the same and it's always going to give us the same message. The foundation of that message is there's salvation through one means only, through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's, there's no other name under heaven by which you must be saved. You know, so they're, they're, it, It's fundamental, it never changes. Yet we live in a world which quite often wants to change how we read and interpret the Bible or say it needs to be updated, it needs to be changed. It'll never change because it's God's word. And it's always going to be true. Now for us in today's society at times that can be a struggle. But that doesn't stop us from loving everyone who's around us and trying to show them God's love regardless of how they interpret the Bible. And that's what we have to do. And that's the standard that we have to show. That we are good in our relationships, that we are firm in our relationships and that we bring Christ's love. I mean, there's a warning in this, in the next verse, do not be attracted by strange new ideas. If you think that new ideas are new now, sorry, they're not, they're 2000 years old. They're all the way back in the New Testament where people were trying to change ideas and change understandings. So the, the challenges that we face today, they faced them for, for years. They come in different times and they come in different ways at times, but we all face those challenges. And that's why verse 9 says, your strength comes from God's grace. So he uses an example here, the author, not from rules about food, which don't help any of those who follow them. You know, that, that's one thing about food and, and, and about different things we're trying to say, you know, it doesn't matter. It comes from God's grace. You see, food rules, there's a whole lot of things about what you should eat and what you shouldn't eat. You've got to remember the vision which, which, which was had in the New Testament with, with the blanket coming down from heaven and God says, don't call anything that I have made on clean. Um, we are not Jews. We don't fall under Jewish law. We fall under God's law. Um, it's something different for Jews and, and, and their food rules are for Jews. If somebody wants to call himself a Jew and keeping to the rules and regulations. But again, People who are Jewish misinterpret the Bible and what it says about Christ. You know, so there's that whole tension that goes on. Um, but don't be extra be attracted by strange and new ideas. We've got to stay true. When you come to verse 10, the author continues on with the idea of, of food, but in a different way. Um, we have an altar from which the priests in the tabernacle have no right to eat or the tent, um, as it can also be translated. If you know your Old Testament laws and rules about sacrifices, you will, on, you will know that whenever sacrifices were brought to the, the tabernacle and into the temple, that the priests were able to take some of that food for themselves to eat it. Now, a lot of the priests came under criticism because they took food whenever they shouldn't take food, and they ate what they weren't supposed to eat. Um, um, and what the author is saying is our sacrifice now it's got nothing to do with those priests this is between you and God Jesus has done this for you you don't need that intermediary any longer the old system of sacrifices is done away with that's what Christ said whenever he was at um, doing the last supper you know, this is the new covenant of my blood and it was a new system a new promise but it's interesting how everything about the tabernacle reflects back to the Garden of Eden and forward into heaven. And it's the same when it comes to the sacrifices and, and again, reflecting upon Christ. It says, under the old system, the high priest brought the blood of the animals into the holy place as a sacrifice for sin 
and the bodies of the animals were burned outside the camp. So also Jesus suffered and died outside the city gates to make his people holy by means of his own blood. It wasn't by chance that Jesus was crucified outside the city on the hill. It was so symbolic that Jesus was removed from the holy city and his body was destroyed outside the holy city. Just like the, 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 the parts of the animals which weren't eaten were taken outside to be burnt. And you think about Christ's blood running down the hillside towards the city, about how Christ's blood cleanses us, how the blood of the sacrifices was scattered down the sides of the altar, Christ's blood running down the side of that hillside. There's so much symbolism in Christ's death to try and get the people to realise what's happening, to see that this is the one who was promised, that Jesus is the Messiah. But so many people just missed it. Uh, and Jesus lamented about that. The prophets lament about that. You know, the apostles are just so heartbroken that people don't see that. Verse 14 is interesting. For this world is not our permanent home. We look forward to a home yet to come. You know, that's talking about Revelation 21. So it's talking about a new heaven and a new earth from a new old, old heaven and earth pass away. And, you know, and it, sort of, it gives us that sense that, that wherever we will go to after this death is like a temporary place and then there will be the home yet to come. I do believe that whenever we die we are with, with God in his presence. That we're not sleeping as such. Um, when you look at the different things which happen and you look at even the, the story which Jesus tells about the rich man and Lazarus you know, he, he's, he's with Abraham, he's being comforted, he's not sleeping. Um, but yet it's not our permanent home. Read Revelation 21 and read the glory and the splendour and, and what is coming. And to realise that's where we're heading. That's what we've got in front of us. And that's what we've got to look forward to. And it says there, therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name, commitment. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. It comes right the way back to the start of the chapter again about our actions, about how we please God, how we praise God, how we worship God, how we stay committed to him. You know, and that's what it's all about. Okay, we'll leave it there. That's just a run through those those verses from verse 5, 4, sorry, to verse 15. But they're so packed with so much. You know, go back and read it again and think about it and contemplate it. But then just keep coming back to that verse about Jesus, that he is the same yesterday, today and forever, that he never changes and know, as you read verse 8, that his love for you will never change. His commitment to you will never change or never waver. He is always there for you. No matter what's going on and what needs you have, Christ is there. Just trust him. Let's pause and let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you again for the encouragement that it brings to us. But thank you also for the challenge that it brings. Lord, help us to challenge ourselves each day in how we are living for you and serving you in our relationships and how that is seen by others. So that, Lord, that we can give a good account of your love to those who are around us. So, Lord, thank you. And go with us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, folks, for joining in on Facebook. I'm going to shut that down now as we go over to Zoom to pray. But take care and God bless. Bible study will be back again next week. Bye for now.